good morning to everybody in the United States and good afternoon to everybody based in Europe and welcome everybody else who is joining us today for this <clears throat> webinar called Business as Usual, Shaping Relations with China. Um, this webinar is part of the Wunderbar Together 2020 series um, and we would really like to thank the Goethe Institute for their support for these for this series. Um, we'll be talking about China, business relations with China, challenges in the relations with China, and we have secured two great speakers um, to, to discuss this with us. Um, <clears throat> first, we have Mr. Fridolin Strack. He is head of the Department of the International Markets at the Federation of German Industries. He is also the managing director of the Asia Pacific Committee of German Business and a member of the Board of Management of the German Health Alliance. Um, he covers bilateral economic relations and bilateral business committees and initiatives with, within the Asia-Pacific Asia region, among other regions. And he's been with the um, Federation of German Industries since 1994. Um, we're also very pleased to welcome Mr. Craig Allen, who is the president of the United States China Business Council. He's been the president since 2018 and there represents um, over 200 American companies doing business with China. Prior to joining the Business Council, he had a long and distinguished career in US public service with many positions in the US Department of Commerce's International Trade Administration and also in the Senior Foreign <clears throat> Service. And I'm really glad to be able to welcome both of you here today. Um, we will start with two brief inputs, one by each of our speakers. Um, and then I will first ask a couple of questions before opening up to general questions to all of you. Um, I would ask you to please, um, if you have a question, to please use the Q&A box, um, which you can find in the familiar place on your Zoom panel below, um, if you have a question. And then I will <clears throat> call on you. Um, Please note that the webinar will be recorded. Um, so let's just get started. And um, basically China this year, I think it's fair to say, other than the elections, China really is on everybody's mind. Um, there's been expectations for economic reforms in China to ensure fairer market access um, that have been, I think, been there both in the United States and in Europe and have been repeatedly disappointed leading to a kind of promise fatigue, one could always almost call it. Um, we have had a situation where of course the pandemic has further had an impact on both US businesses and German businesses in China. Um, we have had many, many adjustments um, in, in how people try to Try to, try to think about China, try to think about the future of China business. So we, we would like to start with um, Fridolin Strack. Um, Fridolin Strack, please just give us a brief take of what, what is the situation for German business in China? What are the main challenges and what can we expect looking forward? Thank you, Mareike, and uh, thank you and the Jim Marshall Fund for inviting me. It's a great pleasure um, to be with you um, and uh, to speak together with Craig Allen. It's an honor um, to, to enter into the discussion. Um, I, uh, I would just quickly cover two points. The first point is um, uh, we, we issued this BDI paper in January 29, um, uh, calling China a partner and systemic competitor, not rival as the commission uh, three months later, but competitor. Um, and uh, um, wh why do, did we change um, our perception of China? And why do we say today um, that business as usual with China is more or less over, uh, at least for German business? Um, first, um, it was Xi Jinping's a speech at the 19th Party Congress um, in autumn 2017, when we thought um, when, when China is in a new era, um, uh, stipulating um, that they will not change to a market economy that will 
they will not change towards a more liberal societal system, um, we clearly had to react to this stipulation um, and had to reposition ourselves, um, which we did um, in defining um, a, a balance between partnership and systemic rivalry. Um, but a second factor drove us. Um, in the past 20 years, um, our problems related to China were more or less pr problems located in China. Restricted market access in China was the main problem 20 years ago, 10 years ago, um, and maybe even five years ago. In the past five years, we had more and more um, European companies saying we are in a very difficult position um, because of unfair competition, uh, distorted competition with Chinese enterprises in our um, traditional markets, and uh, not in China, in China as well, but mostly in traditional markets, in the US market, in EU markets, um, in Brazil, uh, in African markets. Um, and these two basic developments, um, China um, stipulating a new role in international, um, in international field, um, but at the same time, Chinese companies being our main competitor in the global market um, uh, by not playing in the same level playing field. This caused a reshaping of our China policy. Um, what are the three main challenges? Um, again, I would say um, market entry in China still is a core problem. Um, the second core problem um, is, um, and we experienced that for since China opened up the world, China opened up the system of compulsory technology transfer um, that uh, is driven by the government. Um, it is still in place and it, it uh, is enriched by new elements all, of, uh, all the time. And uh, one of the later elements um, in compulsory technology transfer um, that is really of concern to German business is the legislation on cybersecurity um, with uh, requirements for data localization in China and at the same time requirements for data disclosure uh, in, the, uh, in the national interest. Um, a third point um, is what I say would describe as the Chinese system um, uh, of um, Francois Goodman rightly calls it the Chinese hybrid economy. Um, and this mixture of government influence in the economy, um, a large state-owned enterprise sector, um, the coexistence and the, the well-established coexistence between private enterprises and state-owned enterprises um, this special Chinese system um, makes it very difficult to deal um, with China. It makes it very difficult um, to get China into a level playing field. Um, and we come later to what can we do about it? Because in the end, we have probably three extremes. We have a majority of German companies that do business in China and they are for the time being not touched by unfair competition. Um, they operate successfully in China and they are not, not systematically hindered to do their business. A second group, um, and this is at the moment the largest group, um, they say um, we need to do much more in terms of offensive interest China must open its market, but also defensive instruments in our markets to ensure that the market economy is functioning in our markets. A third group um, is a, a very small but rising group um, of entrepreneurs who say even 
if we tackle um, the, the problems of unfair competition, market entry um, in China, compulsory technology transfer, um, anti-subsidy, anti-dumping, even if we tackle this, um, the core of the Chinese economic system will still be this hype system um, and it will not be possible to really um, play level with uh, in the competition vis-a-vis -vis Chinese enterprises. Um, and at the moment, we have these three groups um, and they're all our membership. Um, and for the time being, um, this gives us a good opportunity um, to, to kind of balance between partnership and system rivalry. Maybe this is for the, for the introduction, um, my now six minutes um, uh, to get a sense where German business stands vis-a-vis -vis China. Thank you so much um, for outlining these mostly uh, systemic challenges to German business in China. There are, I think, many questions um, that I have and that we will get back to in our first round of questions. But before we do that, um, I would like to get the perspective from the United States, from Craig Allen. To what extent is the view from the US similar? Are there any differences? What, what is your take? Well, thank you, Marika, and thank you, Fredolin, for uh, inviting me here. Thank you also to the German Marshall Fund and the German Federation of Industries. It's an honor for me uh, to be here today. So many times in the recent past, my Chinese friends have asked me, why has US policy towards China changed? And the reply that I have to give is that China has changed. And if uh, China has changed, is it not true that the United States and others uh, must change our policies in response? Uh, is it not true that we must engage with China as it is uh, rather than what we wish China would be? And I would have to say, you know, why did China change? When did China change? I, I would look back at the great financial recession, 2008, 2009, uh, and cite systemic uh, reasons there. So uh, my impression uh, is very similar to Fredolin's. However, I think that I must admit uh, that uh, my appraisal is grounded in American history and American geography. We are a Pacific country uh, and we have long-term alliances with Japan, Korea, Australia, uh, New Zealand and the Philippines. And of course, uh, good partnerships with many other countries uh, in uh, the region. Uh, and for example, China's uh, creation of artificial islands in the South China Sea, uh, which violates international law, uh, must be considered a, a threat to the freedom of navigation and to the rights uh, and privileges of our, of our allies. From a business perspective, uh, I'd say that we look at the picture uh, is almost in almost equal measure as positive uh, and uh, negative. In terms of the positive, uh, I would point to the structural changes brought out in the phase one negotiations, especially intellectual property rights, uh, financial services, and agriculture. Now, I recognize uh, that the EU has uh, concerns about the quantitative targets uh, associated with the phase one agreement. But I hope that you will agree with me that on the qualitative side, there have been some policy improvements. Also on the positive side, we look at China's rapidly growing middle class and we wanna sell into that market freely. Um, so after the election, uh, I am hopeful that we will continue phase two negotiations uh, on such unresolved uh, issues, such as uh, subsidies, I would put up there as number one. Technology policy is also number one. And if I could have a third number one, it would be state-owned enterprises. And then if you give me a, a generously a fourth number one, cyber, oh, oh, and I have to add data also, data, very important. So uh, these are the same concerns uh, that Fredolin uh, just uh, uh, suggested, 
perhaps with a difference of emphasis uh, here and uh, there. However, when I look at China's domestic uh, evolution, uh, I see little room to be hopeful, uh, especially in the near term. Uh, in uh, the fifth plenum of the 19th Party Congress, which I think starts uh, uh, today or yesterday, uh, I, there are uh, many, many hints uh, that rather than reaching for a more market orientation, the Communist Party is going to increase its control over companies uh, and uh, the economy. The dual circulation uh, policy uh, certainly emphasizes self-reliance, techno-nationalism, and a preference for state-owned enterprises over the private sector. So I think we need to ask ourselves uh, some uh, questions. What are the implications of dual circulation for foreign companies? What are the implications of dual circulation for China's technology policy and uh, China's uh, role as a global innovation uh, echo center? Uh, center? What are uh, what is what are the implications for the WTO in dual circulation? In my view. The WTO implies that you treat a foreign product the same as a domestic product, and dual circulation would uh, uh, seem to call that into question. And then finally, uh, on self-reliance, I think that China's uh, uh, innovative capacity is fantastic, and we want it to play uh, a constructive role in the global economy. However, if China is going to follow techno-nationalism and self-reliance and, and aspire to be leading in all technological innovations, then that calls into question uh, many things um, that we need to address. Uh, China could, must, must be an equal cooperative player in the global innovation ecosystem rather than looking at it uh, from a uh, dual circulation policy rather than uh, always emphasizing self-reliance at the expense of foreign companies. So I'll stop there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for for those for laying out the basic issues that you've been seeing. Um, I want to remind everyone to please start sending your questions to the Q&A um, to write out your questions there. Um, before I, I turn to audience questions, I kind of want to I want to revisit some some of what you said in your input. Perhaps first a question to Mr. Strack. Um, now. China, China has changed. Has China changed? And I want to ask you, when did, Mr. Strat, when did Germany, when and why did Germany start reassessing China's role in all in, in all of this? If we could lay out a little bit, what 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 changed for German businesses? Um, well, again, I would say, um, uh, if you look back from today you could easily argue um, that the rationale um, of devoting all priorities to the power of the communist party that you can see this policy for the, the existence of china as such um, since the 40s onwards um, but um, we experienced in the 80s um, and in the it, until the mid 90s we experienced major steps of china towards integrating into the world integrate into the world economy um, opening up the country um, with olympic games in beijing with an uh, the first expo um, that we had 2010 in shanghai um, a major breakthrough for us was the accession of China to the WTO. Um, and um, constantly we, we had a, we and we still do have a debate um, in China on 
the reform of the state-owned enterprise sector, the SOE sector. Um, so what changed? Um, we always had the feeling that China can go away either towards more integrated system with the world economy, um, open its market, um, curb down on state-owned enterprises, but they could also at, they could um, they could um, also take a decision um, towards um, a restoration of the power of the party, a restoration um, of more control um, in all aspects. And Craig formulated this very well. Um, China is is about um, to install a lot of new tools of controlling every aspect uh, of life in China and related to China. Um, and uh, um, the decision with the Xi Jinping era to go in the latter direction um, and to set a clear priority um, in um, making China great again in terms of technology, in terms of military power, um, in terms of internal control of the Communist Party. Um, uh, to my our analysis, um, this had this had a kind of a new. We have reached a new level um, in this, um, and this led to a reshaping of our perception of China um, and uh, our China policy. Um, also, um, a more cautious perception uh, in German business. It has not turned um, to business um, uh, turning their back on China and the Chinese market. Definitely not. Um, but the times of doing a sort of a naive business with China, these times are over. Um, and we need to um, all businesses, no matter if they are German or whatever, we need to uh, be much more open um, in terms of who are our Chinese partners, um, in what kind of business are they involved, um, what are the current human rights questions that are in on the table in China, what is the possible involvement uh, if you look at co corporate value chains. Um, these are all uh, discussions um, that were not so much on the table five years ago, um, and they are on the table for all of our companies um, for today and even more so for the time come. Maybe that describes a little bit of the difference. Right, yeah, um, there really has been quite a bit of change. And I want to ask one more, perhaps a little provocative um, question to Mr. Allen. You managed, you mentioned the trade war, you managed the phase one trade deal, started talking about phase two trade deal. I mean, if one looked at this very harshly, one could say that, you know, President Trump has really thrown a lot of stuff, a lot of tariffs at China, has really been very hard on this and despite this he basically got a very limited deal is there really any hope in trying to get the chinese side to change to make any structural or systemic changes or is that something that wouldn't it be better to just give up on that and try to look at it more realistically yeah thank you monica i, I think it's a great question and uh there's a lot of debate in Washington now exactly over uh, this question. Um, I will argue uh, that uh, the systemic changes China made in intellectual property rights, financial services, and agriculture as a result of phase one were very successful. Uh, I will also argue that all of the difficult issues uh, state-owned enterprises, subsidies, tech policy, cyber, antitrust, uh, were also put off. Um, my argument is that in all of these areas, it is in China's interest to move forward in a manner that is compatible with the WTO. And that if China uh, wants to escape the middle income trap before it becomes very old, I'll give it five, five or seven years, 
uh, here before the labor force begins to decline, um, then they need to address the phase two issues. It is in China's interest to do so. Now, there's a tendency to say, well, we win, you lose, black and white, on and off, yes or no. And I think that that's the wrong paradigm. Uh, I think that rather making incremental progress on these issues is what we need to aim for. We do not wish uh, to um, have uh, a complete victory. Uh, we wish to make steady incremental progress with an end result uh, of China's convergence into the global economy uh, within a foreseeable uh, uh, time period. And I think that if you look at it from that limited incremental uh, perspective that yes, uh, we, we can uh, achieve that. And I will argue that we can achieve that much more effectively if uh, the United States and the EU work together. Uh, with other like-minded nations uh, that, uh, that perceive uh, these issues in a WTO uh, framed uh, capacity, not limited to the WTO, but uh, instructed uh, by the WTO, which I think every member of the German Federation of Industries uh, relies on. Uh, and so we wish to uh, extend and, and upgrade and um, to uh, reform uh, that system. And we'd love to do it with you. Thank you. Mareike, if you allow me, I would like to add just a quick comment. Um, I found the, the pressure um, that the Trump administration uh, has put on China um, uh, from European perspective, I think it was quite helpful uh, because um, first, um, we, we, I, I think that China feels a certain pressure um, uh, stemming from um, the, the trade war and uh, the extra tariffs. Um, second, um, my guess had always been um, that while um, the, the Trump administration is in negotiations with China on a deal we Europeans, we would be left aside until this deal would be done. Um, now we are in the situation that the US still puts pressure on China and we kind of feel um, that China um, uh, has to prove that they are able to cooperate um, with Western um, uh, partners and uh, it seems that China is willing um, to make some concessions um, uh, in the EU-China uh, investment agreement negotiations. And definitely, I would say, we, we profit from the pressure that the US put on China. And um, we would have never seen any concessions um, without this help from Washington. Yeah, this leads us into our, I think, um, into our round of questions from the audience. We have a lot of questions coming in and I will try to bundle them a little bit. There have been indeed some questions on how concretely, and I think we're already delving into that, how can the US and Europe concretely work together on this issue? Um, we have one question um that is about the role of the us eu dialogue on china which was officially initiated on friday um by the us department of state and the european external action service um how can this dialogue can this be a format to shape policy vis-a-vis -vis china um and I, I think, um, yeah, we'll start with those. What other formats do you see for collaboration here between the two sides? Well, let, let me take a first uh, a shot. Uh, I, uh, I think that uh, US-EU relations have been uh, stressed uh, excessively. Uh, and that as we look to uh, reconceptualize the U.S. relationship with China, um, it is uh, vitally important uh, that we strengthen 
uh, our relations uh, with uh, the EU. Um, uh, I, I'll be honest, as a former trade negotiator, I think that the EU uh, has more experience and superb um, uh, negotiators, particularly in state-owned enterprises and, and subsidies. Uh, we have somewhat different philosophies uh, about uh, antitrust, uh, but uh, I think in all of these areas, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, room for cooperation. Perhaps the most important area, however, is uh, technology. Uh, and of course, that has to do with both subsidies and state-owned enterprises. They are intricately uh, linked. Uh, but uh, I think in that area uh, that uh, strengthening uh, US-EU institutions uh, across funding, across uh, at the university level, at the company level, at every level, uh, would be uh, an important starting point. Uh, and then uh, coordinating on uh, both export controls, investment controls, and other policy uh, related issues is beneficial uh, to both. Uh, so um, EU is complex. Uh, some of these disciplines are, are uh, national, some are, are EU, uh, uh, and but that's a complexity that we must work around. Uh, we need to deal with the EU uh, at every level uh, in a more proactive manner, in my view. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like me to add, um, uh, I, I fully agree um, with what Craig said. Um, and um, yes, we do have um, a, a large bundle um, of uh, of dialogues with China um, at the EU level, um, we have probably much more uh, because we have um, the EU-China summit, um, uh, but uh, we have national dialogues from Germany to China, um, from France to China. Uh, we have this uh, one plus 17 um, that the Chinese have installed uh, that it's not it's not working well at the moment, but still we do have a lot of these dialogue channels. Um, but to be honest, um, most of them are not producing the right results at the moment. This is why I fully agree with Craig that we should keep this di these channels dialogue open. They are necessary, but at the same time, um, it is necessary to increase the dialogue on China issues with our international partners. Um, uh, it is necessary to come back to cooperation uh, between U U US and EU um, and possibly include, Craig, you mentioned Pan and Australia. To me, they are core partners in this discussion. Um, and third angle of this agenda, keeping dialogues open um, establishing new international agenda with so-called like-minded countries and partners. Um, and at the same time, um, I think we still do have a lot of homework to do, um, not so much in the US, but more um, in the EU in terms of um, keeping our market economy functioning while the Chinese enterprises operate in our markets and we want to keep open our economies, the US economy, um, European economy, uh, but we need more tools um, to tackle um, anti-subsidy um, in state-owned enterprises, um, to tackle unfair competition um, and to cope um, with what China uh, does in uh, in um, economic planning in, the, in China 2025. Um, we, we do need more leverage vis-a-vis -vis China um, when it comes to our own instruments in our markets. Yeah, so this is obviously not something that will happen very easily. I have another question that says, a question following up on Mr. Stuck's point on global supply chains and human rights. 
do you think German companies should set red lines for doing business in China to underline that they do not agree with, hum the, with the human rights situation? For instance, not maintain or build production sites in Xinjiang. And I, I, I guess I would add to that and simply also open that up, up for American companies and perhaps add the, the, the thing to what extent do companies have to work around? I mean, there are lots of initiatives such as new sanctions, um, the um, the Bing Tuan in Xinjiang has been put on the sanctions list. How does that affect businesses and how are businesses generally navigating these issues? Well, I'd, I'd be happy to start. Uh, there is um, legislation uh, that's pending uh, that would ban uh, uh, presumptively all imports uh, from Xinjiang that uh, you cannot prove have been made from forced labor. And I think that that would be uh, a very big uh, bit of legislation, which I uh, do believe will pass, um, uh, perhaps this year, perhaps early next year. Um, uh, and the sponsors of that legislation uh, note uh, that uh, we need to take a, 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 a stand uh, against the human rights abuses uh, in uh, Xinjiang, despite the fact that there will be uh, a global supply chain uh, disruptions. Uh, my uh, uh, advice uh, to our Chinese friends is uh, to please allow inspections uh, in Xinjiang, uh, like you allow elsewhere, so that we are able to comply with US law uh, and uh, visit any facility that we want to visit that is a part of the export supply chain. So there's a technical angle of this, there's a human rights angle of this, a, a legal angle to this, uh, and they all point to greater transparency and greater uh, easing of um, uh, the uh, uh, the ethnic policies or the minority policies, uh, not only in Xinjiang but but elsewhere uh, in China. Uh, so I hope that we are able to make progress on this issue. It looks right now like uh, we're headed in the opposite direction, though. Thank you. Um, it was well said. Um, I would only underline what you said, Greg, um, and that this is, I think, this is, uh, it reflects um, the general trend um, in European industry um, to be extremely cautious with these issues. Um, an example that I might give um, for certain headline is um, that we have statements from leading German CEOs. They, for example, say, um, if we have employees that stand up for their rights in Hong Kong in a peaceful way um, and do not conflict with local laws, um, we protect these people. If, um, if the Chinese government tells us to save those people, um, we will not follow. Um, and we probably need um, an alliance of business because it's always very difficult for individual business if they are put under pressure um, from the government in Beijing. Um, we need some sort of solidarity mechanism um, that uh, uh, we stand up, uh, business stands up uh, um, for each other. Um, th this uh, cross national, um, but uh, the, the debate and the discussion on red lines and uh, um, it's an ongoing um, discussion um, and it's but there are no, no easy answers um, the simply pulling out of province of Xinjiang with production would not be our answer because this would mean um, that we would leave many markets where things are not well organized as in the US or in many European states. Um, and, uh, um, we have to carefully monitor what we do um, in these regions and how we do it, but pulling out is not a solution um, that we would 
uh, we would say that it is justified by the circumstances. Yeah, and it's also, it's, I guess, difficult to handle given that even if you're not based in Xinjiang, there are good chances that you will get implicated through other links in China that have ties there. Um, Going to cluster two other questions. One is, um, and I think they, I, they, I would pose them to both of you. Um, you, Mr. Allen, you mentioned that there were some concerning hints coming out of this week's fifth plenum. Can you clarify some of those trade issues a bit more? And the other one related to the next five year plan will be published within this week and is currently under discussion. What are your expectations? Any guesses on what will be decided? And any guesses on how this will influence the relations with China and the United States and Germany, respectively? So either. Well, yeah, I, 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 I thank you for the question. And I think that uh, it is clear uh, that uh, the party is going to reiterate um, the self-reliance and the technology self-dependence uh, and uh, the other policies associated with the Made in China 2025 uh, agenda. Um, the, the party uh, is committed uh, to uh, further uh, reform by innovation, by, by developing independent um, technologies uh, that it will deploy aggressively ar around the world. Um, I think that, um, and, and, and there's a, a WTO appropriate way to do that and a WTO inappropriate way to do that. And I think that uh, at this stage, our Chinese friends uh, are not uh, being overly thoughtful about WTO commitments and are moving uh, ahead very aggressively uh, in uh, the technology development area. Uh, and those are all of the areas where Europe and America and Japan uh, have had a lead for many, many uh, years. Uh, and an area where Europe, um, America and Japan have shared uh, technology generously, uh, not only with China, but around the world. And so I think that um, what I would be concerned about is this excessive uh, techno-nationalism uh, leading uh, to preferences for Chinese companies away from American uh, or European or Japanese companies. So I think that we're in a very similar situation here. And, and that um, uh, makes it easier uh, for us uh, to all work. Uh, to, uh, you could take 5G uh, as an example. Uh, currently, uh, uh, Chinese companies control 36% of the uh, 5G patent pool, up from about zero in for 2G. Uh, so 6G, what will it be like? Well, I would welcome Chinese participation, but I will not welcome Chinese domination of uh, 6G uh, telephony. Uh, Europe has national champions here. Uh, and I, I uh, want to work uh, uh, across with all companies and uh, regret very much uh, if non-Chinese companies are disadvantaged in their te technological um, uh, R&D uh, capabilities uh, by unfair trading practices. And that's something that we should be very clear, forthright, uh, and insistent on. Uh, uh, henceforth. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're running out of time, but I do, I do want to, I mean, I want to give Mr. Shak the opportunity to respond to this as well. Um, I'm very sorry we did not get around to all the questions that were asked, um, but perhaps for, for closing remarks, for very brief closing remarks from each of you, um, if you could consider are we, what, 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 is, what will be the impact of the US elections? Also another issue that has come up multiple times in the Q&A. What is the role of that? Do we have enough common ground that it doesn't matter? Or do you think it makes, it will make a big difference of who will be in the White House? Um, perhaps if you could limit yourself to, to roughly one minute. 
Uh, Craig, uh, I leave you the last word. Uh, let me, uh, if I if I may, I use 30 seconds on the five-year plan um, and start by saying um, uh, it, it, that in 5G um, we have two European champions um, because uh, Nokia is very much um, Finland-based, um, but uh, it includes a, a large part of Siemens uh, communications. Um, and uh, a lot of the manufacturing and a lot of the technology uh, obviously is located in Germany uh, with German engineers and it's a, a Finnish-German symbiosis, uh, Nokia, and a, a, to my feeling, success story. Um, on the five-year plan, yes, um, I uh, definitely think this is the direction um, China will um, will. Uh, since they do not emphasize made in China 2025, um, this will be put in the content of the five-year plan. It will be innovation, innovation, innovation. Um, and uh, we should make one reference um, to the U.S. entity list. Um, I think companies like Huawei are under immense pressure uh, to come up uh, with new innovation, uh, chip development, um, uh, in order to be more um, more robust and uh, and uh, to uh, to be competitive uh, in the year 2021 and 2022, uh, which is not self-evident. Uh, what do I expect um, from U.S. elections? Um, yes, I do expect um, that uh, after uh, we have seen a phase where the U.S. does a policy um, and um, and put it on our table with the, um, with the message, uh, join us, um, this is our policy. Um, if, we, if we are able um, to come to joint policies again, this would be a major step forward. Um, and again, if we include other international partners, um, I give you a weird example, um, uh, uh, business associations in Mexico and Peru, um, they are um, asking the European Union in this situation of Chinese-US conflict uh, take a more precise leadership um, for, a, for a neutral role, um, for a value-based role that would be very similar to what the US wants, but in a different style. Um, and this is um, a perfect situation for more cooperation. Thank you, Friedrich Strack, for those um, good closing words. Craig Allen, you have the last word, um, briefly, please. Thank you. Uh, the tension between the US and the EU and between the US and Germany causes me great pain. Um, I think that uh, we uh, must have much better relations and that our fates are, are intertwined. Uh, Stalin uh, said that uh, quantity has a quality all of its own. And what he meant by that is that China's scale is so big that if we do not work together, then we are going to be dwarfed. Uh, the United States has, uh, the United States and the EU together have less than half of China's population. Uh, we uh, need uh, to work together if we are to effectively uh, address our challenges. And moreover, it is in China's interest that we do so. Uh, if China is to uh, get out of the middle class trap, if China is to become a fully developed country, then it needs to begin again to converge with the global economy rather than continue to diverge from the global economy. And I think that uh, this election offers us an opportunity to reconsider, to reconceptualize uh, the US-China relationship in partnership with our European colleagues. And that is something that I would look forward to doing very, very much. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. I think this will be a challenge that will be with us for several more years, if not longer. Um, but I want to thank both of our speakers very much for joining us today, for sharing your insights and your perspectives. Um, I also want to thank everybody in the audience for joining us today. We hope you'll be joining us again in the future. Um, 
Have a good day and see you next time. Thank you.